Chapter 31. The Residence of William Lomenthal, Oxford, England, June 17th, 1889. Athena felt numb and weightless with lack of sleep as the carriage finally began to slow down. Their senses were dulled and the shadows of the trees against the inky canvas of night swayed in their vision. In the rare moments that Dr. Quakeson had spoken on their journey, muttering directions to Seven through the hatch which opened onto the driver's seat, their voices sounded distant and vague, their words indistinguishable. Athena was tired, not just physically, but emotionally. He was just tired of all of it. She wanted it to be over. She wanted to sit with Jamie, nestled against each other on a lounge chair, listening to Ray's ramblings. He wanted to be home in London, peering up through the smog at the distant stars through Ray's telescopes. He wanted to feel safe again, to feel like himself again. A memory drifted to the surface of their mind, muffled and distant, tucked far away in the recesses of childhood. Athena had been younger then, barely more than ten. It was the first few months after Ray had taken him in, and he had been left alone in the study. She had been amazed by the fireplace, fascinated by the way the flames curled around the logs. They had trialed with this. They had tried with their small, pudgy child hands to throw more fuel onto it as it died, stumbling across the room with arms laden with logs. And he had fallen directly into the fire. Athena knew it should have hurt. Even at that age, they were aware fire should burn, except it didn't. The flames tickled at their skin and washed over her with a comforting sensation of stepping into a bath. He lay there, tangled in the coal and soot, unsure of what to do, and waiting for the pain. Only the pain never came. The carriage jolted to a halt, and Athena was jerked from their memories, dragged into the cold night air. We're here, Sherbert said flatly. There was something in the chemist's eyes that Athena couldn't quite place. Something icy and distant which failed to match the easy smile plastered across their face. Athena peered through the darkness. A patch of overgrown lawn was visible in the light of the lamp which hung from the front of the carriage. Beyond their circle of warmth, the pale shadows of distant hills seemed ghostly and cold in the moonlight. Everything felt cold to Athena now. They knew it was their own fault. It wasn't that the world was too cold, it was simply that they were too warm. Where are we? Athena asked. It doesn't matter. Another one of the abandoned homes Easton owns. Sherbert waved the question aside with their hand. Seven, bring the light. There was a sound of scraping metal as Seven got down from the front of the carriage. Sherbert had dressed the automaton in a large cloak, hoping to disguise his unnatural appearance from anyone who may have seen them in passing. Now, in the light of the lantern, Seven was a statuesque visage of death itself, skeletal and glimmering, cloaked in the shadows of the billowing robe. They followed obediently as Sherbert began moving towards the house down the path, leaving Athena no choice but to follow. What are we doing here, Sherb? Dr. Quakeson looked sideways at Athena over their collar, turned up against the wind. You'll see. They turned to stare at the front door. The house was silent and empty. Seven, make sure no one's inside. Seven placed down the lantern and approached the door the cloak flowing behind them in the warm breeze. They tried the door, the metal of their fingers scraping against the ornately sculpted handle. It appears to be locked, Dr. Quakeson. Then break it open, Sherbert sighed. Athena looked between the two. Seven, you don't have to... Yes, Sherbert said forcefully. He does. Seven? Seven paused for a while their glowing eyes lingering on Athena before he slammed one hand clean through the wood, sending a shower of splinters into the hole beyond. The door swung open and Seven stepped inside, letting it swing shut behind them. I will begin a scan of the premises, Seven stated from inside. On the other side of the door, Sherbert rolled their eyes. Thank you. Seven paused in the entryway. His head swiveled on his thin neck, and something at his feet caught his attention. An envelope. 
Seven picked it up. To William Lomenthal. The words were written in crisp, curling cursive across the yellow paper. Seven stood for a moment, contemplating the letter. He had not been given instructions on what to do if there was a letter inside. In fact, he didn't know how to react to this at all. The machine bent down and picked up the letter, the paper crinkling under his rusted fingers. Should they give this to Dr. Quakeson? It was certainly not addressed to Dr. Quakeson. He had not been given instructions to give anything to them. They had simply been asked to look for anyone inside. Slowly, as if his body were resisting the movements, Seven placed the letter inside the pocket of his vest and began searching the premises. Outside, Athena crossed their arms and then uncrossed them again. Dr. Quakeson, I don't understand why we're here. Are we moving from Mancroft House? Sherbert laughed a humorless laugh. No, Athena, we're not moving. We're here because you're going to destroy this house. Athena blinked his pupilless eyes. Pardon? You heard me, Sherbert shrugged, placing their purple hands on the pockets of their coat. You say you can't control your gifts? Learn to. Athena shook their head. But I can't do... I don't even know how. We did those tests at Bancroft. You know I don't know what I am or how to... How to do that. Is that the truth? Athena stared up at the scientist. Sherbert didn't look back at them. Their face was pointed at the empty building, heterochromatic eyes far away. Of course it's the truth. Why would I lie about that? Sherbert's head snapped suddenly to face the youth. Well, it wouldn't be the first thing you've lied about, would it, Athena? I, I'm sorry? Athena stammered, taken aback by the doctor's abrupt accusation. I don't understand what you mean. In response, Sherbert reached into the pocket of their coat and pulled out a piece of paper. They began to unfold it as they spoke, now not taking their vibrant, stained eyes off Athena. Blood pooled in their yellow, once-brown eye, and Athena tried not to stare at it under the intensity of Sherbert's gaze. I believe I told you that you were not allowed to contact anyone else for your own safety. Do you remember that, Athena? Athena nodded slowly, relaxation sinking like a weight in her stomach. In fact, I believe you promised me that you wouldn't even try. That you agreed, for your own safety, that contact should be minimal. Sherbert held out the page, words and tear stains facing the youth. And yet, I discovered this. A letter to Strawberry, telling her everything, when you knew that she didn't want to hear from you. I... Athena's mouth opened and closed. I didn't try to send it. But you wrote it, Sherbert raised an eyebrow. Athena swallowed. I thought... I just thought she deserved to know, Sherbert. I thought I should tell her that I'm sorry, that this was an accident, and that I'm so, so sorry. Sherbert reached forward and grabbed Athena's arm, pulling him in close. They stared unblinkingly into her eyes for a moment, nostrils flaring. Here is how this is going to work, Athena. Athena noticed the stench of decay on their breath, hitting him in the face each time the chemist's chest heaved. Their teeth were slick with a fresh, viscous lilac sheen, and in the back of Athena's mind a revelation began to form. It seemed that Dr. Quakeson hadn't been telling the whole truth either. We are going to do this, Sherbert began, still holding Athena tight, for your own protection. Every time you disobey me, or David, or Easton, or hell, even Seven, you are not only risking your own discovery, your own life, but ours too. Do you understand me? Athena nodded. They were too scared, taken aback by the sudden anger in Sherbert's voice, to even process the thought that the chemist wasn't in control of their own mind. So we're going to have a system from now on. Three strikes, Athena. This letter. Sherbert held up the page, crushing it in their hand. This is strike one. 
Their grip tightened, nails digging into a thing of skin through her shirt. You don't want to know what happens when you get to strike three. Have I made myself perfectly clear? Athena nodded again, mouth clamped shut and tears threatened to spill from their eyes. Good. Sherbet shoved Athena backwards, sending the teen stumbling, crashing down onto the muddy earth with an audible thump. So now that that is out of the way, Sherbet straightened the wrinkles of their coat. You are going to burn this house to the ground. Athena panted on the ground, eyes wide as they looked up at Sherbet. I don't know how to do that. Then figure it out, Sherbet snapped before composing themselves. When they spoke again, their voice was calm and nurturing, or at least as close to it as they could manage. I would hate for you to hit strike two so soon after hitting the first. Athena sat forward and pulled their hair out of their eyes, slowly standing to face the building. H how should I start? Her mouth was dry, and every word felt as though I had to force its way out from behind a sob which lingered in the back of her throat. Sherbet sighed. Just think about it, they suggested. The wave of power you let out in Ray's home. How did that feel? Athena shuddered. I was sad, he breathed, swallowing. I miss him. What I did to Ray after having lost Jamie, and he choked on the words. I miss them so much. That's it, Dr. Quixie nodded. Use that sadness. Force it out onto the house. Imagine it burning down. Imagine it crumbling. This is the first step to getting Jamie back. We need your power to open the rift. Trust me, Athena. The teenager nodded, closing their eyes. They let down the walls which they had been holding back all of their sadness that had been they let down the walls which had been holding back all of the sadness that had been building for weeks. She let the numbness and the grief wash over her, crushing her down into the earth as she tried to push back, tried to push that weight towards the house as Sherbet had suggested. Nothing happened. Athena opened their eyes, breathing heavily. A few glass tears fell to the grass at his feet. Well? Sherbet asked. I'm sorry, Athena muttered. I don't know. I don't think I can do this, Dr. Quaison. I... I'm sorry. Sherbert took a long, deep breath through their nose, exhaling through softly parted lips. They pressed their hand to their temple, closing their eyes in thought. I see. So perhaps it wasn't sadness, but it was an emotion, wasn't it? That's what David said, perhaps. Fear, they suggested, grinning at Athena. He blinked. I... Maybe. But Sherbet, I'm not scared. Athena didn't see Sherbet's fist coming until it had already connected with her jaw. The punch sent him reeling back through the tall grass, white spots dancing in his vision as pain flooded across his face. If they made any exclamation of pain, the sudden ringing in their ears drowned it out. Sherbet, on the other hand, let out a rather loud as they shook out their hand before launching themselves at Athena again, crashing into the youth and sending them both tumbling to the ground. Doctor! Athena managed to grasp as the breath was knocked from their lungs. Their head felt fuzzy after colliding with the ground. What are... Sherbet pinned Athena to the ground. In front of them, the chemist was aware of Seven emerging from the house. The robot stood, just out of Athena's field of view. Seven's face showed no emotion, but through the blood pooling in their eyes, Sherbert could have sworn they saw horror etched upon the surface of the metal man's face. Fear, Dr. Quakeson grunted, grabbing Athena's collar and once again slamming his head into the dirt. You're hurting me! Athena grunted as she tried to pull air back into her lungs. Sherbet punched him again. It had been too many days without results, too long without hearing Endyrian's voice, too long with David breathing down their neck, taunting them. 
too long trapped in the foggy grey void. Then hurt me back, they screamed. Come on then. I think they tried to scream as they felt their nose crack under Dr. Quakeson's fist. The mangled yell that forced its way out was garbled and choked by the blood which streamed down the back of their throat. Please, <laughs> Athena coughed. Sherbert stood up, still gripping Athena by the collar, and swung them off the ground. Athena slammed into the wall of the house, limbs flailing in the air as they crumpled to the dirt. He let out a soft wheeze as his little remaining breath was once again knocked from his lungs. Dr. Quayson stumbled a bit with exhaustion, shaking out their arms as they approached Athena, lying on the ground like a discarded ragdoll. Bite me back, Athena. I won't stop until you do. Athena, shakily, began to stir, pulling himself up onto his knees. I don't... I don't understand. Sherbet knelt down on the grass and placed a finger gently under Athena's chin lifting the teen's face up tenderly to look them in the eye. I know. I know you don't. And I'm sorry, Athena. But this is for your own good. This is the only way to open the rift again. I'm doing this for you. You know that, don't you? Athena, bloods flowing steadily down their face, took a moment to let their unfocused eyes weave up to Sherbet's face. I... I don't take pleasure in this, but I have to do it. To help you control what you can do. To bring your power to the surface. You understand that, don't you, Athena? Athena, dazed, felt themselves nod ever so slightly. Sherwood's hand, still cupped under his chin, offered no resistance to the subtle movement. I... I under... Their thoughts were sluggish, drowning in blood and honey in their mind, desperately trying to surface for air. Sherbert. I'm glad that you know that. Sherbert smiled kindly. It makes it easier, if you know that. And Athena saw that the smile seemed genuine. They didn't want to hurt him. Not really. Sherbert cared about him. Sherbert was his friend. They were trying to help. Sherbert had said so. They were just trying to help. Weren't they? Athena's beaten and bruised mind felt this was wrong. An instinct buried somewhere beneath the aching and the lost in the pain shouted at her to think about this. But thinking only hurt more. It was so much easier to accept this. To fall into the viscous ocean of their mind. Was this necessary? To save Jamie, to bring them back, did this have to happen? He couldn't take much more of this. He wanted it to stop. Athena wanted to go home. They wanted to go back to Bancroft House. Me? Athena coughed, trying to stand and spitting a glob of deep red blood into the grass. Please, Sherbert. Oh, Athena. Sherbert kicked her in the shin and the team buckled, dropping heavily to the ground. Don't you see? Sherbert grabbed a chunk of Athena's auburn hair and yanked his head back up against the wall so the two could see eye to eye. The air around Athena was hot and humid, and, Ath and Sherbert could see the haze of warmth surrounding the youth. This was good. This was progress. A halo of heat for an angel of fire. No. Not a halo for an angel. A crown for a prince. I am helping you, Dr. Quixen continued. This is help. They punched Athena in the gut once more and she didn't resist beyond a groan. I'm helping you as much as I can, Athena. 
That's what friends do, isn't it? They help each other. But Athena could feel themselves slipping away from reality. Everything around them felt hazy and flickering, the dying flames of a campfire in the night. Flames, they thought distantly, as Sherbet kicked them hard in the stomach. That's it. Let go. Sherbet sounded distorted and far away, as if Athena was hearing them from deep underwater. I won't tell anyone you just read it. It'll be our little secret. Good friends keep secrets, don't they? Athena saw the fist coming this time, yet they didn't feel it connect with their face. They just felt a rushing and warmth, a tightness in their muscles and a relief and ease as it slipped into the darkness and their head sunk below the surface. Sherbet was thrown backwards mid-swing. They could feel the air scorching their skin and singeing their hair. They barely pulled the collar of their coat up in time to shield their face from the flames. The small fires across their clothes were smothered as their body tumbled end over end across the ground, sparks lighting the dry summer grass around them. Bruised and battered, though still in infinitely better the condition than Athena. Bruised and battered, though still in infinitely better condition than Athena, Sherbet pulled themselves up, panting and patting out the remaining flames. Their ears were ringing. They shielded their eyes against the blaze which now engulfed the front of the building entirely. And at the center of it all, a crumpled dark shape surrounded by the blinding light, was Athena, unconscious on the ground. Collect him. Sherbert rasped, hunching over to catch their breath through the smoke, gesturing a hand towards the youth. Seven didn't move. He simply stood in the doorway of the home, the flames licking at his clothes, hungry yet starved by his metal body. Sherbert stood up. Seven, I said, collect Athena. Put him in the carriage. Seven nodded slowly. Yes, Dr. Quakeson. The machine trudged through the flames immune to their heat. He emerged a few moments later with Athena cradled in his arms, legs dangling towards the ground. Do you wish for me to drive us back to Bancroft House? Seven asked. Sherbet thought about it for a moment, waiting for the ringing in their ears to subside so they could hear Endyrian's voice more clearly. It never came. No. I want you to stay here. I want you to wait and find out if and when my good friend William returns home. And then I want you to come back to Bancroft House and tell me. Are those instructions clear? Seven nodded. They are very clear, Dr. Quixen. Seven gently placed Athena across the seats in the back of the carriage. Blood had begun to soak into the youth's white shirt and Seven wished he could clean the mess from Athena's face before sending them off. This was a new feeling for Seven, wishing. He was not used to it. He would ponder what it meant exactly while he waited. It was possible he would be waiting for quite a while. Sherbert requested Seven give them the large cloak, now burned and covered in blood, and the robot obliged. They watched as Sherbert, without saying goodbye, flicked the reins off the scared and frantic horses and began off down the road. Seven was illuminated by the roaring flames as the towering house behind him was consumed by the fire, smoke filling the night air in great billowing plumes. It was possible that someone would notice the home's destruction and come to investigate. To prevent any complications should that occur, Seven found himself a spot concealed in the trees and turned to face the house. And there he waited, unmoving as the house collapsed on itself in the deafening cracks and crashes of beams giving way and floors tumbling into ceilings filled the night. He waited as the fire spread through the grass but died before it hit the trees, blown out by the warm wind and smothered by the heavy drops of rain which began to fall sparsely across the countryside. 
Seven watched the fire burn itself to cinders and then out completely. Finally, as the sun began to rise, making the charred remains of the home visible in their gutted entirety, Seven took out the letter concealed in his vest, and he opened it. <laughs>